disease is taking root at that time, and if we're not addressing it then, then we're getting the diagnosis later on. That's what we need to get people to understand is everybody's waiting. They're waiting for the diagnosis. That's the problem. All behavior makes sense. Not to say that all behavior is helpful or ideal, but when we understand the psychology of behavior change, the emotional backstory, and the way that the brain works, things that on the surface appear to be illogical begin to make sense, and we can use that understanding to start shaping true change. If you follow the fitness marketing model, it's like, here's this photo of me. I look this way because I eat these things and I do this exercise. You can just do that same thing too. And then when you show up and find out that that's not going to work for you, Well, I was so enjoying the introductory video that I forgot to throw us back in the studio, hence the slight pause if you're listening to the audio <laughs> version of this. That's a great way to start another episode of Wellness Unfiltered. I'm Coach John McLernan with my co-host, Chris Wilkins, a world-class coach extraordinaire, and a very special guest today, Dr. Julia. Uh, I'm not sure if the last name is D Diganji. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. And uh, who is an expert in psychology far beyond my pay grade and educational qualifications, I believe, uh, which is why that we wanted her to come on today. I'm actually going to toss the mic over to her, a friendly little lob and say, Dr. Julia, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit of what you do, and uh, then we're going to start grilling you if that sounds like fun. Who doesn't want to be interrogated? It sounds like it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's 20 questions live. I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thrilled to be here. So, no, I am actually so glad to be here. It's going to be a fun conversation. Um, I am a neuropsychologist by training. So what that means is I'm a clinical psychologist with specialized expertise in the brain. And um, the way I really think about my work is I think about three things. I think about the brain. I think about leadership. And I think about emotional intelligence. And the reason I think those things are, I, I, I in fact sometimes think if I should just say two things because I think that leadership and emotional intelligence could easily be synonyms. Mm -hmm. mm, I like and that. I think leadership is so important because all, all leadership really is, is our ability to have power over our own lives. So I think it applies obviously in corporate settings, in our work settings, in our re relationships, in our parenting, the way we even show up in social media. So I think right now this conversation about, about leadership and emotional intelligence is so important and I'm glad to have it with you guys. Yeah. And one of the big things that we really want to inspire people or push people towards is this idea of, of taking control of their own health, because there isn't really someone coming to save them. What we've uncovered about our, particularly the medical model that we encounter in, in the United States and Canada to some degree as well is it's, you know, it's great at triage. It's great at trauma. It's great at like physical trauma. It's great at these, you know, we need to keep you alive for these next, you know, day kind of thing but actually steering people towards a healthy way of living existence, it really isn't suited for that. And I think somehow we, we got tripped up along the way being like, I could just mm -hmm. live sort of however I want. And there's this safety net waiting to catch me. And where that's led us is to a place where we have, you know, rampant issues with chronic obesity and chronic health conditions. And uh, a lot of people are not really sure now how they can take control of their own health. And so thinking about this, you know, and I, I wish I actually want to dive into a little bit of where how you pair leadership and emotional intelligence with sort of respect to an individual, because I think Chris and I talk about this expansive model of change where it really starts with our, our self and our internal Absolutely. environment. So I just was hoping that before we dive too far into it, let's let's do some definition of terms, I think, because okay. always, you know, <clears throat> it's important to make sure that everybody understands what we're talking about when we say emotional intelligence, right? Because there's a if you Googled emotional intelligence and like you went to Amazon, there's probably 100 books on the first page that talk about emotional intelligence. But I'd love to know what your definition is. Dr. I would love to define this. So <laughs> you're exactly right. So I, you know, worked in academia for a million years and, you know, academics love to make like, how can we make this as complex as possible. I actually think that emotional intelligence is so powerful. And I think that it is breathtakingly simple. I think there's a huge difference between easy and simple. And you're going to understand what I mean. So you look at a lot of these models, you're exactly right. There's hundreds, if not thousands of books about emotional intelligence. I just saw an article the other day about the 12 domains, lots of diagrams. All emotional intelligence is when you really get down to it, 
is my ability to hold my emotional power in such a way that I can meet life's painful circumstances, my struggles, my stress, my fear, my disappointments, my heartbreaks with breathtaking power. When our life is going well, right? When things are just working out for us and we, we certainly, some of us just have good days, some of us have good years, that is wonderful but that requires absolutely nothing of my own agency. I talk a lot about energy, right? If you think about what the brain is, it is quite literally an electrical machine. Mm -hmm. And it is a machine that is powered by the energy of our emotions. So when things are going well, we're, we're not kind of hamstrung by our own, like I was saying, difficult emotions. And I don't care what you call those difficult emotions, right? Whether you call mm -hmm. it frustration, boredom, inadequacy, or whatever. But when we get in those situations of pain, who we become, as you said, Jonathan, first and foremost for ourselves, determines, I think, the quality of our life. Mm. I like, I'm spinning out on like a hundred questions. So sweet. <laughs> So well, I just wanted to throw a nerd fact out there that the brain produces enough electricity to power a light bulb. And maybe that's why when we talk about having an idea, we have the visualization of a light bulb over our head. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the brain is a, an amazing electro, electrochemical machine. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole body is, right? And I think this is something, especially in Western medicine, we like to try to do is separate this mind and body thing. And they're just not, right? Like, And I, I think that people are starting to move more towards an integrated systems model than we were before. And I, I love what you said about how emotional intelligence is like the fact that your brain is using these emotional chemicals to drive your actions, right? That, that so encompasses for me what trying to teach people to understand and process their emotions is, right? It's like, why am I doing the things that I do? And how do I change that? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I think, you know, another way to think about this is like, just to add, I think if I were to give another because I can talk about emotional intelligence from a lot of different ways, but hmm. who do I become when I don't want to do the things before me that I know that I should do? Who do I become when I don't like the words coming out of your mouth? Who do I become when everybody else, whether it's my partner or my kids or people on social media, aren't doing it the way I'm certain everyone else should be doing it. So in, mm -hmm. in those moments, we get agitated, we get frustrated, we get disappointed, we get angry, we get, do you see what I'm saying? And if you think yes. about the brain, it's, it's, I always say it's the most precious real estate in the world. It's less than on average, it's less than three pounds. Mm. So even though it's a remarkable machine, it has to get efficient, right? So any bad feeling you have, whether everything from kind of like, you know, mild annoyance all the way up to traumatic stress, the same neural circuits that give rise to bad feelings are the same neural circuits that give rise to bad feelings. So who do I become in these moments? And I keep calling this pain because I think it is absolutely the right word. Who do I become in these moments of pain is actually the measure of my power. Mm -hmm. Does that make this sense? Absolutely. Yeah. And from a cultural perspective, like if you look through cultural histories, like of just different places and people's um, you'll see there's always mythology surrounding bravery, strength, overcoming emotional barriers. It's like it's a it's a huge fundamental function of us living together in society, right? It's the ability to like not have that first response, that animalistic first response and always act on it, right? Like, and John loves to always bring up my cats, but you know, if you annoy a cat, they immediately bite you, right? They don't think, gee, mm. I really like this person. And I understand that like they they don't mean to be making me irritated, but I just won't bite them this time, right? Like that does not happen, right? Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that we tend to try to use to differentiate ourselves from the animal world. So I think the other thing that you said that's really interesting, and I'd love to hear how you tie this together, is, is this idea of leadership from this cultural perspective too. Because again, when we look through cultural histories and, and mythologies and things like just stories of, of generations passed down, there are always stories around leadership. So I'm curious why for you and when in your, your kind of research, did you kind of come up with the idea that like leadership is super connected to emotional intelligence? Mm, so like you are saying like all these things that are activating me. So first of all, <laughs> one thing about um, like courage, so you're right there, it's been this like lauded esteemed value since the inception of human time, right? So mm -hmm. we talk about these gorgeous concepts right now of courage, or um, transparency or inclusion or authenticity. That's a big one or vulnerability. Right. 
The reason though, like the reason that people don't have courage in spades and we want courage in spades is the only barrier that stands between me and courage is my own emotional pain. In other words, if the reason it's so hard to be courageous is because it's terrifying. I'm going to say the thing in the room that everyone else is like actively avoiding saying. I'm going to be the person in the room who holds boundaries. I'm going to be the person in the room who does the thing that nobody else is going to do. And there's always a risk with that, right? Mm -hmm. So what I think can be so powerful for people, whether you're talking about physical fitness, whether you're talking about your relationships, whether you're talking about any type of change in your life, is I think it's easy to get kind of lost in the details of our life, right? Because there's always a million. Our lives are complex. But if you really kind of say the only thing that stands between me and the person I want to evolve into being is my emotional pain. And I think, you know, one of the, a really powerful way to think about emotional pain is it's just resistance, right? So, and like, we, we get this so brilliantly on a physical, like I would never go to the gym and only pick up a, a five pound dumbbell and then Thank be really confused and upset <laughs> with myself that I couldn't pick up a 50 pound one. Right. But I think we have to train ourselves to kind of hold this emotional energy. And that is actually quite literally what it is mm. in different ways. So I'm going to take a breath and I still remember your other question, but I want to give you guys a chance to react. Well, I was thinking about emotional resilience. That's a term that, that I find myself using a lot with my clients because it, we, when we look at our the <laughs> behaviors that people are struggling with, this is not an information problem. I, I, I say so many times, like we live in the age of Google. We live in the age of basically infinite information. Maybe the only challenge is sifting through it. But really, if anybody wants to know an answer to a question from an informative standpoint, we have access to that. So then we go, well, what is the real issue here? And I think you've you've sum, summarized it really well. It's this maybe this inability to remain present in the face of this really uncomfortable experience. And I speak from a very personal experience as a, as a recovered sort of binge eating food addict who's been through trauma and PTSD, um, that it was, you know, it was so painful and difficult for me in that experience to cope that I just turned to eating food, trying to somehow make it all go away. So how might someone cultivate emotional resilience? So I think the great news is there's a lot of ways to cultivate emotional resilience. I think, you know, we, you know, you mentioned earlier, Chris, that like, it's, it's really the brain body connection. It's not just like one or the other. And I really think it's like the brain body spirit. So I think, you know, wonderful ways to cultivate emotional resilience in, especially in the case of something like trauma is to process the trauma. If you think about what we, you know, ways that are kind of useful heuristics and thinking about traumas, trauma is trapped energy. And it's energy that's trapped both in the brain and in the body, right? Trauma is, it's really, we we are embodied. So our whole experience, like our bodies are the playing field of our lives. And one of the things I think is, is really important for people to know is Trauma, the parts of your brain that remember trauma, the parts of your brain that even remember, and I don't mean, so I am most fundamentally a trauma expert. So I've done a lot of trauma work globally. A lot of my brain research focuses on um, PTSD and other anxiety disorders. So trauma is stored in the brain. And even, you know, things that are stressful, like, you know, maybe you don't consider it a trauma, but it's a memory that you haven't really been able to let go of. It's stored in a part of the brain that quite literally does not keep time. Right. This Mm. is why trauma is quite literally timeless. So something will happen to you tomorrow and it will remind you of an injury as if the injury just happened. And people get frustrated with themselves. They're like, I'm, you, you know, you guys, one of you made this point earlier. It's like, there's the knowing, this is kind of interesting, I think for a neuropsychologist to say, there is a knowing of the brain And then there is like a knowing of the bones. So all the time I work with, I work with individual patients and I do a lot of um, like leadership coaching and mentorship. My clients and patients will say to me, I know, I know. Why do I keep doing this when I know? (laughs) This is the great conundrum. Which is the intellectual knowing, but then there has to be an emotional knowing. And that's much more of of a a knowing of the body. Hmm. Hmm. I'm, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, both of us are like, what? Oh, so many things, right? Like, okay, so 
let's tie it up with leadership, right? Because that was the first part of the question, because I think that answers some of the questions that I, I'm tempted to ask now. Like, so we've got this pain, right? And, you know, as a society, we're trained to avoid pain, right? And we've, you know, we've engineered our way to a very, very comfortable existence, making us have to face pain so much less frequently than previous generations, right? So we have a lower tolerance to pain, but yet we need this skill in order to be able to continue to act in the face of something uncomfortable, right? We talk a lot about, I know John and I both talk a lot about this with our clients because it's never knowing, right? Like I never have had a client show up and say, I just fundamentally don't know what to eat. Or I just fundamentally don't know how to move my body around, right? Like mm-hmm. these are things that they're not the problem. It's it's generating the consistent behaviors, right? And there's tons of research around habits and tons of research around where that happens in your brain and all of those things. But like at the end of the day, right, where does that capacity in your brain to act in spite of a feeling live? And how do you improve that? Are you asking, like, are you, do you want me to talk specifically about neuroanatomy? So there's, I mean, I do. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, go right ahead. You know, I'll I'll make this just kind of, so there's um, one region of the brain that is very specific for things like cognitive control. Mm -hmm. There's another part of the brain that's very specific for things like affect regulation. So people talk a lot about, you know, the prefrontal cortex, right? There's something this is getting a little bit in the weeds, but something called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that has Mm -hmm. a lot to do with taking painful scenarios in our life and kind of reframing them, right? So can we, can we see this in a different angle? Can we kind of come to this with, with a new perspective? But I think that the, the thing that's so important is that we understand that there is a reason that we have the term growing pains, and that our life is this, this, this perpetual evolution. I always say we're on a journey with no destination, right? So we can always, we can, there's always more to learn about ourselves. There's always more to learn about the world around us. And there's always more to learn about our own internal reality. But the reason, you know, you asked me about leadership. I think that every, I talk about leadership power and I talk about leadership energy, right? And all power really is, I mean, the definition of power is an ability to have an effect. Any effect I want to have on my own life, whether it's to change my relationship with my trauma, as you mentioned, John, whether it's to Mm. change my body type, whether it's to show up differently in my relationships, it requires my own power, my own energy on my own life. I will tell you the best. So I have thought about trauma. So I've done a lot of um, international trauma work, a lot of humanitarian aid. I have worked in traumatized communities all over the globe. I've worked with combat veterans. I've worked with child soldiers. I've worked with orphans. I've worked with parents whose children have been kidnapped in the middle of the night and thrown out of airplanes into the ocean. Oh, my God. I, I have worked and I've had the privilege to walk aside other human beings who have endured excruciating pain. Trauma, external trauma happens to people all the time. That's exactly what trauma is, right? But we also create tremendous amounts of pain in our own life to ourselves. And the most powerful definition I can give you that I really think is life-changing for hopefully your listeners is all your pain comes when you divide yourself from yourself. In other words, I really want to speak up, but I keep my mouth shut. I really want to say no, but I say yes. I really want to relax, but I overwork. In each of those moments, I have divided myself from myself. And in that self-abandonment, in that self-betrayal, I learn that the dangerous person is myself. So then we say we can't trust other people. Well, how are you going to trust other people when Mm -hmm. you can't trust yourself? Mm -hmm. It reminds me of this this quote, and I actually often say this to clients when they're struggling to overcome specific challenges and you keep repeating the same behaviors. It's like, look, you know, Like when you say yes to this behavior, what are you saying no to? And I think it's down to these like core priorities, identities, and values that we have as individuals 
that when we violate them, I think is what you're saying, that we end up with more emotional pain than we can process. Yes. And I think too, a lot of times we get very frustrated with ourselves. Like we were kind of just like laughing a few minutes ago, like how we could know something in, in the intellectual thinking parts of our brain, but then it still is so difficult to execute. Mm -hmm. And I think in that it can create a lot of shame, like, ugh, like what's wrong with me? I'm so frustrated. I know better. And so, mm -hmm. but the thing is, whenever that starts and we've all been there, I've certainly been there, the, the idea of fixing pain with more pain, like shame is self shaming is painful, right? So I mm -hmm. feel bad. What am I going to do? I'm going to like, add more pain to the sandwich. It does not work. All right. It's, it's a good old it's, pain sandwich. Yeah, no one wants a pain sandwich, right? <laughs> so <laughs> if you think though about what happens in human development, it's very, very fascinating. And I think it can give people a lot of mercy and tenderness and understanding of what's going on in our lives. I want you to like zoom out and think back. I have little kids. I don't know, you know, I don't know how much you've been, if you have or have been around little kids, but mm. have you ever seen, so first of all, our native language is a language of emotion. And even more powerfully, our most native language is a language of negative emotion. I don't know about y'all, but like my kids didn't come into the world like giggling and like wide eyed and like, oh, I'm <laughs> here. They were like red faced, enraged and terrified. Okay. So mm -hmm. the first language of the human being is a language of negative emotion. Then the child starts to grow and tell me if you've ever heard a parent talk to a child like this, go tell her you're sorry. I'm not sorry. Sit down. I don't want to sit down. Stand up. I don't, I don't think I want to stand up. Don't do that. Don't be like that. So very early in our development, we start to get these message that takes kind of the native language and starts to turn it into knots. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, we get these signals and no one's really at fault. I think, I mean, I would say over 99% of parents are trying to do the best that they can do for their children. With the so, tools they have. Yeah, exactly. But we get a lot of messages and then these messages. So the best way to think about the brain is as a pattern detector. Mm -hmm. And so we get a lot of coding that the way I feel, I, I didn't wrong. Really want to say sorry to her, but yeah, I guess I need to go. Right. It's re it's really interesting because it's like this this really challenging balance between the needs of the individual and the needs of the group and the society, right? Because we do this as parents as social programming, right? We actually, when we had our daughter, we kind of came at it from the perspective of like, this child came into the world as natural as a human being can be. And it's our job to like, teach this person how to function in society, right? And we, we obviously said it slightly more <laughs> amusingly and sarcastically than that. But that was the underlying thing was like, how that baby comes into the world is not okay enough, right? And once you step away from that, and you think like those natural responses and emotions we have, we're constantly trying to deprogram them for people to fit into the society, the societal model that we currently have, which I think is the root of a lot of our issues. John and I talk a lot about this kind of stuff off camera. So mm. he's smirking down there because he's like, <laughs> oh, Chris, <laughs> this is giving me so much more fodder for later. And it's, but it, but you can't untangle these things, right? Because yeah. if we want to live in groups, we can't only act on our own personal needs all the time, right? Because then we're going to end up with issues around resources. We're going to end up issue, with issues around safety. But at what, how do we balance that then? Because if, if no amount of regulating our own emotions in order to function in a group is, is good from the point of view of it creates pain and potentially trauma, but like a hundred percent is also terrible. Like where along the spectrum do we really need to be for there to be a good balance so that we can have a well-functioning society with well-functioning individuals in it? Oh my God, if we could totally crack this problem. <laughs> Come on, Dr. Julia, I'm sure you have all the answers. I, <laughs> I, I don't have like the precise solution because I don't believe that there is, is a precise, mm. clean, neat with the bow solution. But I will say that every human <clears throat> problem, every kind of interpersonal problem is created by two incredibly powerful but competing drives of the brain. Your brain is absolutely mm -hmm. wired for connection. Mm -hmm. 
Of course, we see this in the infant, right? Like the mm-hmm. infant is fed and soothed and cared for. And, and, the, and the infant's nervous system is regulated or dysregulated by the caregiver. This mm-hmm. is also true. So we now talk about interpersonal neurobiology and romantic relationships. We know that our partners, and this is in my opinion, right? We have a lot of good evidence to substantiate this from the lab, that mm-hmm. our partners regulate our nervous system and they dysregulate our nervous system. Right now, I'm writing a book for Harvard Business Review on the neuroscience of leadership. Like how can leaders lead when the the times are difficult even for them, right? We know that people at work have an effect on our nervous system, okay? Mm -hmm. So we're so wired for connection. On the other side of that coin is the, the neurobiological drive for independence. And this is why when people talk about choice and freedom, you cannot talk about what it is to be a human being without talking about choice and freedom. And mm-hmm. that that drive, I mean, I have very little kids. Like you give you give the two-year-old the orange cup when the two-year-old wanted the green cup. Hell <laughs> yeah. No, <sure>. like, right. <laughs> yeah. Preference and expression and choice. So what ends up happening is I'm desperate to connect with you. I need your connection the way like I need water and food. And at the same time, I need my freedom. I need my own needs met, right? Like Mm -hmm. I I have personal needs that if I feel like they're not being met at the expense of meeting somebody else's needs, we get these unbalanced relationships, right? Yeah, I will say though, I think that people, this is kind of the the next evolution. And I I hope Mm -hmm. that, I think, so I said emotional intelligence can really be simplified. I think the most elite form of emotional intelligence is when it plays out in our relationships, right? Because relationships Mm -hmm. are so complex. I do think the the five, like the most elite version of 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 emotional intelligence, is when I am able to to really, really, really call back my power and understand truly that I don't have any control over other people's behavior. (laughs) Yeah. We still get this really tangled. And the reason we get really tangled is because again, everything maps onto human development. When Mm. you were a child, it was true. Were you going to get fed? I don't know. Was your mom going to feed you? Were you going to get that toy at the grocery store? I don't know. Was grandma going to buy it for you? Were you going to get rocked? I don't know. Was dad going to rock you? So that then looks like in a lot of relationships, if you really cared about me, X. Yes, that's so, yep. Mm. And you see a lot of this, I think now more than ever, people are talking about mental health and Mm -hmm. behavior and relationships. And and I have another question I really wanna make sure we get to, but I'm gonna bring this up and hopefully we can skirt around without getting too deep. But this, like if you're on TikTok or you're on any of these social media platforms, there's this huge, trend right now of basically pegging everyone as a narcissist. I don't know if you've Mm. seen this. Oh, I have. But it's like, it blows my mind because of what we're talking about right now. If you, if you put it into this context that we're discussing this in, right? Like you could, you could literally say any human behavior that meets a personal need is narcissism based off of what's going on. And so there's, I think there's some advantages of people discussing this more widely, but I think there's some danger here too, because it gets, it gets quite easy to label. I think that's where I want to go with this. It's like, yeah. how do you feel about some of these psychology labels that are getting used rather frequently, kind of colloquially now? <clears throat> and maybe, John, maybe we could say something. I was going to say I maybe did. we could f- further this question as well, because for example, I say that I work in the realm of behavioral psychology, but I'm not trying mm-hmm. to lay claim to being a behavioral psychologist. I say that through the training that I have, I mean, I studied marketing psychology, which is in a sense, the study of human behavior to try and, you know, influence people's decisions. Now I like to say that I use my power for good. Um, But there's this idea that because I read an article about narcissism, I now understand narcissism. Like this is a a clinical diet. There's a clinical um, diagnostic standard to actually apply that label. And we're throwing around flippantly, whereas like I've been on the receiving end of actually being in a, in a narcissistic business relationship where I was manipulated for three years and it cost me my life savings. And I didn't realize it until after the fact, because I didn't even know what to look for. So I think it's mm. a, an important 
conversation to have, but I agree with Chris where we're falling into this. The pendulum is almost going too far where it's like anything that feels like a personal grievance to me as you behaving like a narcissist, where we're failing to recognize that we, we are, I love how you describe this balance between meeting our personal needs, our desire for independence versus our desire for human connection to function together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So tell me what, ask me the question again, so I can make sure I'm asking, answering it as pointedly as possible. How do I feel about the fact that there's these terms? Mm, that um, we're throwing these terms around without really a, a, a true grasp of them so that everyone with sort of some sort of slightly unsavory behavior is being labeled as a narcissist when in truth, it's probably actually just falls within the normal spectrum of human behavior. Or trauma so what response, is, right? Because right. Or, or that everything is trauma. You know, as, as again, as a PTSD, I was nearly beaten to death. I would think that that it qualifies as pretty good trauma. Not that trauma is a pissing contest. I don't mean that. But again, there we fall into this temptation. And maybe actually here's where the real curiosity is, is why do we why do we fall into this where it's like, well, I want to be traumatized or I want to have been victimized by a narcissist and so on and so forth, because we th we, we think with our limited scope of understanding that these behavior patterns fall into these diagnostic criteria. You know, you said something, I think, in your in your promo that I completely agree with, that all human behavior really has a function. And I, I get chills every time I say this. If I had a million lifetimes to live, I would live it on this altar of human pain and power a million times. The goodness and the, and the glory of the human spirit is a, is a real thing. And overwhelmingly, people are trying to do good and people are trying to make meaning out of their life. Mm. Pain is incredibly painful. And what it does to us is it confuses us. If you look at any of the neuropsychological literature, when we are in pain, emotional pain, when we're stressed or angry or sad or lonely, all of our, our good neurocognitive, our decision-making, our problem solving, our ability to understand things, our ability to pay attention, it all goes, OK, mm -hmm. so I think when people are in pain, the organism like and I'm not now talking about human, I'm just talking about like living things. There is a reflexive reaction to say, get me out of this thing. Mm -hmm. And if I can, if I can in pain when I'm when I'm, I'm in that chaos. I feel I feel victimized and I feel like I'm not in control. So if I can point to you and say, hey, you're doing this to me. If there's a, if there's an origin, if there's a source, if there's a if there's a, a rationale that I can follow, I think that what it does for people in the short term is it gives them a sense of hope. The problem is if that's not the real cause, then the illusion can become a little bit dangerous, right? Because I think it's this thing, and then it's not really that thing, and then I think it's this thing, and it's not really that thing, and I think it's this thing. I had um. I do a lot of sessions today. So I had a lot of talks with clients. And one of the themes that kept coming up is the idea of pain in the moving finish line. Meaning as soon as I get into this relationship, I'm, my pain's going to end. Nope. As yeah. soon as I get out of this relationship, my pain's going to end. Nope. As soon as I get this promotion, my pain's going to end. Nope. As soon as I have this child, my this is what I mean by emotional power. Mm. How do I rise in a life where my pain is not a problem, it's just a part of life. I think that's the key though, is this idea that we can we can end pain or exit it mm. and, and remove it. But I, I think that's such a faulty premise that we carry around in this particular society, right? And I don't know that all cultures do, but for sure, this the avoidance of pain, the avoidance of work and labor as well, right? Because like I said, you know, we've engineered ourselves to a place where daily life really requires very little physical labor. And there's, I think there's kind of a connection there because physical labor is uncomfortable. If you have to consistently go hunt down food, like you don't want to do that every single time. You don't want to have to repair your roof when it's leaking, but you do these things to avoid more pain, right? It's not that no pain is happening, but you're on a sliding scale of pain rather than mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. being like zero or all the pain. And I think until as a society, we can do what you're saying, which is like, understand that like, there's no end, <laughs> to challenging things. There's no end to discomfort, right? Then it's it's hard to find your power. And I just want to, 
Go insert ahead. one thing in here. For those who are watching live, if you're enjoying this conversation, uh, share out this video on whatever platform you're watching. I am loving, <laughs> like, I'm like, I just want to be a fly on the wall and sit back in this conversation because this is obviously clearly an area that I am fascinated by and deeply interested and in, continue to study. But I'm also thoroughly enjoying this conversation. So anybody who happens to be watching live, do do share this out if you think this is valuable for people to hear. <clears throat> Chris, I want to kind of respond to something you said. So I, I don't know that I entirely agree, and this is why. So this is how I think about it, and I'd love to hear what you guys think. So I think that, well, this part I don't think. This part, I don't. the brain is really a pattern detector, right? So it's like apple, 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 banana, banana, banana. Like this isn't going to work. This isn't going to work. This isn't going to work. It never works out for me. It never works out for me. It never works out. So we kind of get, now I told you that the, the electricity that's really powering your brain is this electricity of emotion. Okay. So how do we take this idea that the brain is a pattern detector and emotion and really integrate it in a way that I think is life-changing? People live their whole lives on an altar of what is familiar. <laughs> so if that means to me, you know what? People always disappoint me. People always disappoint me. Guess what's going to show up? Disappointment. People can't trust right. me. People can't trust me. Look, people can't trust me. And I, never get I really want to ask about neuro-linguistic programming now. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so I actually don't think that people are afraid of heart. If you look at people, they are bedraggled. They are exhausted. They have mm. no margin. They feel like they can't bear. So, so okay, so I, I agree with you that we're now a very sedentary society. And part of this is now obviously our relationship with technology and mm. what technology does to the brain. But I think part of it is like people feel like it's dangerous to go on a hike. People feel like it's self-indulgent yes. to... You know, and we talk, we have these like conversations about self-care. This is the missing piece about self-care. You're like, people are gonna be like, well, this woman stopped talking about pain. Like she's such like, <laughs> but the, the reason I can't do self-care, get ready for, have your mind blown is because it's painful. Yes. This is what I'm, this is yeah. what I'm trying to say. Actually, I think maybe I to really take a vacation. I feel too guilty to go get a massage. I yes, that's, I think that's what I mean by avoiding the difficult things, whatever that might be. Right. And sometimes it's self-care things that are more difficult than continuing to exist in the type of pain you're comfortable with, right? Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, I don't think I maybe articulated it well, but I think I think there's so many interesting things here. Like I, well, you you articulated something <laughs> that I want to highlight here as well, and where where we have very little margin. So let me just give you an example mm -hmm. of a conversation I had today with a gentleman. You know, he's 33 years old. Um, he, he wants to drop maybe 20, 30 pounds. So we go, cool, let's let's figure out what's going on in your life. Well, he works a full-time job in a very high-stress corporate position. He also runs a part-time business uh, at 10 hours a week. He also volunteers at his church another 10 hours a week. He also has four kids oh, and so gosh. on. Right. So we look at all of this and we go, if I was trying to hand you a meal plan or a training plan or anything like this, your brain's going to go F you, basically because there's no space in there. And like, it seems like with so many people that I go to work with, like the very first thing I'm doing is I'm going, where the heck is there any space right now? Where is mm -hmm. there, where can we find any kind of capacity? Chris, it's kind of like the too, uh, too busy Ray, I think. Yes, totally. Like <laughs> I was thinking that actually, and it's the case study I'm having to work through again for this next level as well. Right. And it's, it's very similar. It's, you know, expecting that 24 year old expectations of this client that they had, right? Like, I, you know, at 24, I was in the gym two hours a day and I was doing this and I was doing that. And it's like, but now you have three kids and a job and a dog and a house and all of these other things. Like, is it really realistic to expect yourself to be able to do exactly the same thing you were doing in a completely different life situation? You know, and, and I think that's a, that's another one of these, it's a habit problem, right? Like in my brain, those were my ideal habits. Like I was really happy with this set of things that I did, but I also wanted these other things. I wanted to have a family and I wanted to have a, a career and, and this kind of, you know, evolution of my person, but I haven't let go of some of these other parts. I'm, I'm always trying to add, right? So I think you're right about the, I mean, I haven't really kind of thought about it this way, but it's not that people are pain avoidant. It's that 
they're not good with different types of pain, maybe. Is that more a better way to say it? Like they're, they're good with familiar types of pain. Yes. So people will stay because like, just like think about, think mm. about your life, think about people you know intimately. Like it is not uncommon that people stay in relationships that don't feel good right. to them, that people do things that don't feel good to them, that people stay in jobs that don't feel good to them, that people get into conversations that don't feel good to them. So it's not... There are some very powerful similarities between mental and physical pain, but there are some distinctions, right? If most likely, 99.9% .9 of us, if we put our hand on a hot stove, we would pull our hand off and we would not do it again. That's mm -hmm. called one trial learning, right? Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the brain and its pattern detection, what we if you think about what is familiar, this is how the brain works, okay? The brain says, no matter how bad it made you feel, no matter how disappointed you are, no matter how much you know that you're built for more than this, at least we know that you can survive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this other option that you're proposing to me, I hear you. And yes, on some days it does sound very, very convincing. But the problem is I'm not sure we're going to survive it. And then the part, like the thinking part is like, it's a new job in a new building, two buildings down. Like people don't die from that. And your brain's like, you never know. You know, <laughs> relationship. Well, you'll probably die alone under a viaduct and no one will ever touch or look at you again. Don't right. leave. So we come up with these narratives that at the most fundamental level are paradoxically enough quite self-protective. If you're if, if survival is your sole metric of success. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really hard to unprogram, like, because that, and I, I want to kind of go back to one of the first questions I asked that we didn't quite get to, which is, you know, this idea of the prefrontal cortex is where these actions happen, right? Where the processing of trauma happens, if I understood correctly what you were saying. Yes. Mm -hmm. But the trauma probably doesn't live there, right? If we, if we look at how the brain was built over time, evolutionarily, right? We had an amygdala and then sort of things got added onto it as we evolved. And our prefrontal cortex was kind of the last lump, <laughs> So to speak, I mean, I'm not really making it very basic, but if we were constantly, and we talk a lot about this, like people, again, are starting to be very aware of the amygdala versus the prefrontal cortex. And people are often calling it the thinky brain versus the lizard brain or the you know, elephant in the rider. There's lots of colloquialisms now that we have to sort of start discussing this, which I think is great and new. And we didn't have this before, right? Not probably, Definitely not in the 70s, right? I'm not quite sure when this started to become a little more mainstream, but it's it's really interesting to see this. So I kind of want to like figure out from your perspective and your research, like if I'm having this trauma response in a different part of my brain and my prefrontal cortex is trying to help me solve it, like what does that process actually look like? How do people know they're making progress through that trauma? Hmm. So let me tell you, I'm going to use a, a really extreme example. And the reason I'm going to use an extreme example is because if it's true at the extreme, if you think about, again, this, the idea that the circuits that give rise to terror are the same circuits that give rise to, you know, anger, and irritation. In other words, it's not it's not like every emotion in your brain has different circuitry. Right. So if you think about really pathological forms of anxiety where people are really suffering, let's take PTSD. So PTSD is an anxiety disorder, OCD social anxiety, panic, what, when you think about the re you, what you're really talking about is you want the brain to be what we call functionally integrated, mm -hmm. right? So what the, all parts of the brain, like all parts of the body, we want them working optimally. You can have presentations where people are too kind of limbically active, right? So they're, they're presenting, they're very anxious, they're very hypervigilant there, but you can also have people who they're very, um, they're overly analytical, Right. And they're, they're, there's almost kind of this um, the sense you get is like they're, they're not integrated with their feelings. Everything yeah. becomes so you can you what you want is the brain to be communicating with itself quite well. Mm. So when you think about something like PTSD, what the brain is doing. So there's a trauma memory in PTSD. And the brain says, whatever you do, because remember, trauma is timeless. OK, so I'm going to I'll give you an example. Like I work with combat veterans. So a lot of these guys, when they came back, for for example, from Iraq and Afghanistan, they had a lot of trouble driving on the roads of Boston or a lot of trouble driving on the roads of Chicago. Well, they know in the brain that this is not a convoy. They're in they're in the suburbs of Chicago. No, no but, IEDs waiting for them. Right. 
But the part of the brain that does not really remember time, <laughs> its sole focus is to generalize danger so that it can have this very vigilant safety response. It starts driving 150 miles an hour through a school zone. Well, that's a problem, right? Yeah. So what you have, what the, the most evidence-based gold standard treatments are for, for anxiety disorders, including things like PTSD, is you have people talk in great, great detail about the worst traumatic thing that has ever happened to them. Okay. Now, you can imagine at first, they're like, you know, are you out of your mind? Like, I've just spent the last 15, 20 years avoiding all that. I don't drive anymore. I don't go to restaurants. I don't go to movie theaters. I don't go on public transportation. So there's, a, you know, to your point, Chris, it's an avoidance response. You're exactly right. So the brain says, stay safe by avoiding. But what the, what the brain needs to be able to see is the one part of the brain watch, needs to watch the other part of the brain re-talk about the trauma in real time so that the part of the brain that keeps going, it's now, it's now, it's now, it's now, we're really going to die, we're really going to die, we're really going to die, gets to process those energies and realize like, I can release that because it is not actually happening in real time. So long as the brain goes, don't open that door, don't open that door, don't open that door, you're going to think maybe there really is a monster in that closet. So the purpose of, of, of talk therapy, for example, the reason we think it kind of reorganizes the brain is it allows the brain to kind of open the proverbial door and go, look, the thing that you thought was going to be so awful, it happened 15 years ago. This it's is not, it doesn't keep happening. I call this the fuzzy monster in our head. And what what I mean is that it's, it's this unclear vision that we have that keeps growing bigger and bigger and bigger in our head because we haven't defined it in any sense of the word. Like this is a, maybe a poor crossover analogy, but like you think in a movie, they show you glimpses of the monster or glimpses of the bad guy or glimpses of whatever. And then let your brain just run with it. I think that's a brilliant analogy. I think that's spot on. And we know that, you know, have you heard about emotional contagion? Like it's mm. a little bit scary, but then it should probably be more scary and then it should probably be more scary. So, mm -hmm. and again, at the most basic level, I suppose that is a protective response. The problem is you're miserable. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like somehow the act of using the, the language center of your brain to sort of move this around Yes, helps. helps you process it then, right? Because you're using, I mean, obviously it's not even part necessarily of your prefrontal cortex, your language center of your brain, but you're getting it out of the fuzzy monster space and into another like lighter, opener, more public opener. space. Yeah, the part of the word. Language, <laughs> language is, is, a, is a frontal function. And so by right. using linear language, you, and you're, if you really think about what you're talking about when you're doing like, for example, talking about your stress to your partner or going to therapy and talking to a psychologist about your trauma is you're talking about sensation. Mm -hmm. So do you understand sorry. what I'm saying? Yes, no, totally. No, I just have another question. So then, all right. So if you can get it out linguistically, right? Like you could also get it out with your other senses then, right? So this is where art therapy comes in or some of this other stuff. Is, is that as effective as processing it, processing it linguistically? So the, again, the gold standard, meaning the, the treatment that has the most and like various types of treatments have been looked at. But if we're talking about PTSD specifically, or we're talking about OCD, or we're talking about panic, the, the, the most evidence-based treatment is really this model where you are, you are talking about your hottest spot of the trauma. Would mm -hmm. art therapy work? I'm, I'm totally... I'm, I'm speculating, so I want to be very clear about that. But if I were to draw a picture about the very, like the hottest spot of the trauma, could that work? I don't see why not. But you have to get to the very part that you thought you couldn't tolerate, right? In other words, my emotional power, my emotional recovery is only as strong as my my most challenged part. If I could run, you know, a seven minute mile, which I can't. If I could run a seven minute mile, <laughs> if it weren't for my knee then in order for me to get to the seven minute mile, I have to deal with the most vulnerable part, which is my knee. It's the same mm. thing when we think about how do we deal with the struggle and the stress and the strife in our life. It's like, tell me what the weakest part is. And it's always the part we think it's too ugly or too dark or too dangerous. When I talk to people, when I really do trauma processing, they'll start to say, I, I, I can't talk about that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'll say, okay, well, why? And then it, that's when it starts to get 
a little fuzzy. They start to go like, I think I'm going to die. And I say, do you, okay, so you think like, do you think in, in the many years I've been doing this, do you, how many people do you think have fallen dead in my office? <laughs> right. And they'll be like, none. And they're like, okay, I might throw up. And I'm like, there's a garbage can. Do you think that like, if, if that's the thing that's holding you back, like, do you think that we could, in other words, we can deal with that, right? Mm -hmm. So what they're really saying though, because th again, the thinking brain is like, okay, I don't really think I'm going to have a heart attack. I do maybe think I'm going to throw up or I do think I'm maybe going to cry, mm -hmm. but that would be worth it if I, if I could heal. So it's again, the part of the brain that controls sensation is saying, don't open this. Don't open this door because if you open the door, because trauma is timeless, because stress is timeless, it's going to be like it's happening all over again. And so the way to get over our stress and our, and our injuries, our past injuries, is to really recognize that they, they are in the past. And the way that we do this is we tell the narrative. Mm -hmm. you, you described, and I, I find myself seeing this very often, like a brain... One is a pattern detector, but it's also like a meaning making machine. So we create stories to try to illustrate or describe our experience or to explain our patterns of behavior. Mm -hmm. And and so I, I think there's there's real power in this. I, I wanted to shift gears just a little bit because, man, there's like so many more things. I'm like, we're just going to have to have another one of these conversations. But you talked about uh, brain, body, spirit. And I wrote down the words like mind, soul. So there's certain parts of the human experience that are somewhat intangible. Like maybe we can describe it as electrical impulses. But like when we describe a mind, like this, this somehow this sort of consciousness, it's not something that we can pull out and kind of put in a jar and, and weigh you know, how, how would you, in, in your estimation, your experience, how would you describe something like consciousness and sort of where it, where it comes from? Oh my gosh. My old, my old <laughs> mentor, this question used to drive him crazy. Cause he's like, you know, I mean, it's understandable that people always want to, I mean, who isn't interested in human consciousness, right? Mm. But what, what is consciousness? Um, I don't know. I mean, what is, what is the energy of life itself? Mm-hmm. I was yeah. just pondering this in the shower today and I was thinking like, you know, <laughs> this is just still out there. Like there's just so much we just don't know yet. And I, and I think we've come so far in the last 20 years with the ability to do better imaging and to see, you know, to conduct better studies on this stuff and to have more and more people who are interested in these fields. I think there's been a ton of progress, but you know, we're just scratching the surface. Well, we're totally we're... Scratch yeah. I mean, there's really fascinating. So I don't know if you guys have ever heard of like, prosopagnosia, but it's it's a condition where, so facial recognition has its own geography in the mm. brain, right? Because face recognition is so important. There's like rare conditions where people cannot recognize. So let's say you had some kind of brain insult or you've had a stroke, you cannot recognize people's faces. So, you know, you, you might've been married to someone for 50 years. They call you on the, and you, you'll see people do these experiments in labs the spouse will be standing there. They'll be like, I don't know that person. And then you'll show them their hand and they'll know who it is. Or really? they'll call on the phone and they'll they'll know exactly who it is. So it's just, so my point here is what is consciousness, right? Yeah. Consciousness, if I had to, and now I'm speaking way above my pay grade, but um, I think it's the energy, the energy that builds worlds. We've been in evolution for 13.8 billion years. Like, I, I don't, I can't explain it, certainly. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you talked, about, yeah, you talk about like, like, the, like the spirit. Like there's there's this intangible element to the human experience that Absolutely. we really can't quantify. And yet it's such a crucial part of trying to make sense of our our existence. You know, this, and uh, this idea of like trapped, um, trapped energy. Well, where is that energy, you know, trauma being trapped energy? Where is that energy being stored? And so I'm asking this question kind of selfishly um, because, uh, you know, 16, 17 years ago, I had two motorcycle accidents and both times I've injured my left hip. And now mm -hmm. in the last year or so, my hip has started giving me all manner of grief for no really explainable reason. No, there's no, no immediate acute injury to it. And yet I'm having trouble with like walking and loading, like I can walk, I'm not, but any kind of loading, any kind of shifting, things like that. So there's all this pain in my hip and we've had scans and we can't find anything structurally wrong with the hip. And yet there's something going on there. And I go, is this connected to that somehow? And how the heck did that get connected 17 years later? You know, um, so sometimes I don't know if you've ever encountered something all like this. All the time, all the time. 
you know, I just, so obviously like if you work with, um, I, I do do a lot of work with sexual trauma. So, you know, you'll have people still talk about like pelvis pain or mm -hmm. um, I just saw someone earlier and they were talking about, and they were just saying, I remember when I, and they, it took them a while to even say something like this, but they were saying something to the effect of, um, I really feel like I can feel this pain in my heart. Which is, you know, we talk about like, I mean, obviously everyone knows like the brain and the heart and the brain and the heart. And mm. so for them to say like, really where the pain gets localized in my body is my heart. I've heard people talk about their throat, like they don't know why, but like their throat just feels like vulnerable. And there's all these, you know, who, no one has the, the full range on all of knowledge and information, right? So it's going to be like, the, the more we integrate, the more powerful we're going to become. So you have these ancient like chakra systems, right? You have different sort of traditions of medicine and different traditions of investigation. So I think the more we really think about the human experience is one that absolutely involves the brain, but the body. And also there is a, there is a human spirit, right? So how we think about all of those things is going to make us, I think, the most what we would call like functionally integrated, integrated. Well, well oiled machine. Mm -hmm. And not just as individuals, but like how do we integrate with each other? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's it's quite a, not, not just a plausible, but a, a, a quite a, a common experience for people to say, I have this pain in this part of my body that I can't yeah. really explain, yes. that we, we can't yeah. through medical imaging sort of create any kind of, reason why this exists you know because uh, I, I, I say that's uncommon at all you know uh because i think the power of the mind is really really fascinating here again to sort of create some sort of physical manifestation you know just think about the placebo effect in medical research mm -hmm. you know you take someone you know one study i came across recently where you know they gave you know kids one group you know standard dose of adhd medication another group half the dose and a third group half the dose plus the placebo and group three getting half the dose plus placebo had the same essentially almost identical results to the group getting the full dose mm -hmm. because in their mind they were getting the full dose. Mm -hmm. And so there's something to be said, you know, I don't, I don't believe like we are obviously a physical being and we can't, we can't avoid, I think if we want to develop and cultivate health, for example, we can't avoid the physical experience, but there's somehow the mind ties into being able to amplify or enhance the physical experience. But it's also like a, a bi-directional thing here. It's a two way street where we can, the mind can really I think, drive us in the direction of poor health, or if we can harness the power of this, we can really amplify what it is we're seeking to pursue. And maybe just one other example, and then I, I'm just going to kind of lob it over to you, you know, get your thoughts. But they, they took these, these people and had them do finger strengthening exercises. One group was physically doing the exercise, the other group laid in bed and visualized doing them. So group one saw a 30% increase in strength, the ones that actually did the exercise. Group two, 22% increase in strength just by lying in bed visualizing doing this. Yeah. That to me is is a fascinating, amazing, remarkable, and even mind-boggling that just by visualizing something in our brain, we can create a physical response in our body. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're talking about right now is the power of belief. You mm -hmm. know, it's like that saying, like those who believe they can and those who believe they can't, they're right. That's oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that our beliefs are incredibly, incredibly powerful, you know, and there's, there's, there's no, there's virtually no single factor that's going to explain a complex phenomenon entirely, right? So like, mm. for example, with trauma, we actually know that tra the trauma itself is not the most predictive element of how people, so you take two people who've been exposed to the same trauma and they can respond very differently. Why? You know, and there's, I mean, you, human life itself is just so complex. And so I think we're really just scratching the surface of how to integrate the all components of the human experience. And can I, uh, can I indulge in one, one more question here? And this yeah. is because I, I just wrote down a whole bunch of things that I'm like, uh, the habenula, uh, this is, this part of the brain that I'd never really encountered before that I just came across or was presented to me very recently. Apparently this little region of the brain that detects failure and detects and records failure. And I, I, you know, I try to think about what's the biological purpose of a part of this in our brain. And I think if we go back to the, you know, for most of human experience, we lived in a, a, an existence where food is, is scarce. And so we need to record times that we expend energy in a futile fashion to, 
not repeat that behavior. But now what we see is, of course, we live in a calorie abundant, you know, society that's largely driven by technology and our brain is still recording certain things as failures. So maybe how we perceive um, something to be a failure or not can affect our ability to act. Um, I'm not sure what your understanding is on this. Uh, like it's, to me, it's very new, this idea of the habenial, but it's really fascinating. So I'm not sure what your, your understanding of this is. But I'm kind of curious. Well, let me tell you how I would respond to your question is I would say that nothing, nothing has any meaning until there's emotion added to it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if I say to you, what is failure? I mean, you ask 10 people that question, they're going to have 10 different responses, right? Mm -hmm. So if I say to you, remember the number 78249, and then I ask you in five minutes, you're not going to remember that because there was no, there was no emotional valence. So the very mm -hmm. meaning, the very meaning of the things that we think are so meaningful entirely depends on the emotional energy that we, we activate. And then, and then we further keep ascribing to it, right? This is why some people will say, like, I fail forward, like a great way to, it's not failure, it's innovation. Like that's mm, mm, mm. And then some people can be quite shook by it, right? So I think that, you know, the way to really think about this powerfully is like, what is the emotional energy that is coming up regardless of the condition? I think a lot of times people will say, tell me the condition and then I'll tell you how I feel. What was the situation? And then I'll tell you how I feel. I don't think it goes that way. I think a lot of times, not 100% of the time, but a hundred, but a lot of the times it goes, tell me the emotion, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then I'll tell you about the situation. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fascinating. So then, it, you know, because I, I wonder if this is just sort of uh, tacking on to this, we've gotten to this place where we're almost afraid to talk about negative things you know, like, oh my gosh, don't say the word goal. Don't use a performative mindset. Don't, you know, like, like, because this might, you know, I don't know, make somebody feel bad and, and, and whatnot. And, and I, I, it's almost bring it right back to this emotional resilience thing uh, and emotional, I'm not sure what terminology you use, but I, I think emotional resilience started at the beginning of the conversation here. You know, um, we, we live in a world that I think doesn't give us very many opportunities to cultivate genuine emotional resilience. And we're not really, we're not really educating people how to, how to develop this because we're not exposed to as, as much pain. And so. Are we not exposed to as much pain or is it just really different than what right, we're right. programmed to respond to? True. Yes. Thank you for picking up on that. I think it, it's, or I look at like maybe what life looked like for, you know, people in generations past where it was like children died and, you know, people starved and, and so on. And we don't, we don't see this as commonly in our modern first world living conditions, right? We, we, we have the internet, we have electricity, we have, you know, all of this. And so I wonder if maybe not that I'm, not that I'm wanting to go back to a thousand years ago when like, you know, if four out of your 10 kids were going to die, but you know, maybe not being, we were so sanitized from that. I wonder if that's inhibiting or, or to some degree our ability to cultivate emotional resilience or am I off the mark here? Yeah, I don't know that I would agree with that. So I think obviously certainly, it, you know, our, our technology has gotten better. Mortality rates have decreased substantially, but I think that, I don't know. I think that there's something, you know, all of this is an evolution across generations, right? We're talking mm -hmm. about who knows how long, like the evolution, like I said, we've been in process for 13.8 billion years. What do we look like in another 200, 2000, 200,000 years? I have no idea. Right. But I do think there's something to be said about in every evolution. If you look at it from a certain angle, it's going to look messy for the first time in history. I think people are talking about native emotional sensations about you know, fame about pain in different ways does that then create its own challenges and maybe do people you know y yes things can certainly get out of balance but mm. i i remain very optimistic that i think that this is such a a healthy evolution and then you did say something i agree with a billion percent is why why for the love of god are we not teaching emotional resilience, emotional regulation, how to, how to really think powerfully about our, our own pain 
at a very young age when the brain mm. is actually the most plastic, right? When it, when it can, it's so, you know, we learn languages earlier when we're children. So why do we not have gorgeous curriculums around teaching this idea of emotion regulation? I mean, if there was one skill I could give the world, <laughs> right. mm -hmm. yes. emotional intelligence, like how, when I get disappointed, upset, hurt, what is the most powerful way for me to respond in a way that protects me and protects the integrity of, of the people around me? Mm. As a middle schooler, this is definitely something I, I'm working really hard with my daughter to try to work on these skills for her because I feel like this is one of the things when I was in middle school, I was not in any way aware of or in any capacity yeah. capable of, right? And no one around me was either. And I think it's like, you know, she's already had a few middle school kind of drama moments and there was a bit of a bullying situation. And I, you know, we worked really hard on the tools to deal with that and what to do and how to process her feelings when she would come home absolutely distraught with this, you know. And in the end, she kind of said to me a couple of days ago, because the bully is now out of the picture and she's found a new friend group and all as well. She said, I can't believe how painful that was. This is, I swear, these are her words. I can't mm. believe how painful that was and how simple it was to change it. She said, it just felt so hard to do it. And I was like, oh, that is so magical. <laughs> like what it you so just magical. said. Wow. <laughs> that just blew my, how old your daughter? She's 12. Um, okay, your 12 year old just blew my mind. She could yeah. give me some pro tips. I'll give her a call after this conversation. <laughs> yeah, and it's, I, I, it was one of those, I was absolutely speechless as a parent for not the first time in my parenting, parenting experience, <laughs> but that was not expected, right? And it's out of nowhere, we were just sitting on the couch. And so I just thought to myself, this really is super powerful. And her school had tried to do a bit of a curriculum around growth mindset versus fixed mindset, and she absolutely rebelled against it. So I'm not sure what it is that she's picked up differently from what we're doing versus what the school is attempting to do, but there's, there's so much opportunity here, right? And these children are capable of it. I think that's yeah. the thing we sometimes minimize mm. what we think children are capable of. But I've, you know, I've not really ever called her a child. I always call her a tiny human. And mm -hmm. it's because I think I want to get rid of that idea that children are different from us and they're not mm -hmm. the same. And they don't have the same feelings or responses or their brains aren't developed enough for these concepts. And I, yeah. I rail against that quite a lot because as a kid, I found that very frustrating. So obviously that's personal, but um, you know, it's really interesting to watch her evolution socially because she's kind of come up with these tools a bit more. Like I'm no expert. I know hmm. probably I know just enough to be dangerous, really. But yeah. <laughs> I, I just I was blown away by that response and the fact that this is really something teachable. This is teachable. Mm. It is. Yeah. Wow. I love that story. Well, it's <laughs> yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. I would love to to uh, explore more of this in another conversation. And thank you so much for, for being really generous with your time, Dr. Julia. Yes. It's uh, really um, I, I love that I get to like throw my thoughts into a room with other people and put them up to scrutiny and have them ha other perspectives offered to me because that's really where growth comes from. And so for anybody else who got to enjoy this conversation, you know, that's a bonus. But for me, I was like, wow, this is this is phenomenal. So I really, really genuinely appreciate that. And maybe just to kind of close things out, I wonder if we could uh, uh, throw it over to you and just say if there was one nugget that you would like to sort of kind of condense and share with people that they could take maybe take action on from what they've heard today. What might that be? I would say to really get clear about what, you know, this idea of emotional power. So what, what do you want? What does your leadership in your life look like in its best expression? What do you desire? Where do you want more authenticity? Where do you want more excitement? Where do you want more vitality? And to really get curious about the emotional sensations, the emotional pain that is probably one of, if not the biggest obstacles to delivering you the life that you desire. Amazing. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, thank you so much. That's been amazing. And thank you everybody for tuning in. I hope you've really, truly enjoyed this and uh, stay tuned for another episode coming your way. Thank you're you starting guys. This Deep Health Academy, try to start to change the narrative around what it means to get healthy and fit and to lead a fulfilling life because in the end this is what our clients come to us for whether they think they want a six-pack or not right like 
for the vast majority of people, if they do manage to achieve that goal, they still are the same person they were before they had a six pack. And a lot of the issues that they were feeling haven't been resolved. So there's mindsets, beliefs, identities, and we have to bring them into our conscious awareness. If we're going to create change, the process of bringing into our conscious awareness can be uncomfortable because now we're going to see our flaws as they are. We're going to see ourselves without the filter, but with compassion, we can look at it with a curious desire to understand. And so compassion and awareness is where we create transformation.